Use of force called into question. High school students in La Mesa walk out after a violent encounter with police is caught on camera. Where did the money go? KPBS looks into Bonnie DeManis' pledge to give campaign dollars linked to a convicted felon to charity. And the building boom south of the border. Diwana's condo craze shows no sign of slowing down. I'm Ebony Monet. The KPBS Roundtable starts now. Welcome to our discussion of the week's top stories. I'm Ebony Monet, and for Mark Sauer, joining me at the KPBS Roundtable are Michael Smullins, a columnist for the San Diego Union Tribune, and Amitha Sharma, investigative reporter for KPBS News, Lindsay Winkley, who covers public safety for the San Diego Union Tribune, and Philip Molnar, real estate and business reporter also from the San Diego Union Tribune. We start with calls of police brutality in La Mesa. Video hit social media this week showing a police officer Officer slamming a handcuffed teenage girl to the ground at Helix Charter High School. La Mesa police have reassigned the officer identified as Scott Wolfing as police investigate whether the use of force was appropriate. Students and community members are calling for changes to how police interact with the public. Lindsay, you've been covering this story. What led to the encounter? Well, <clears throat> that kind of depends on who you ask. So when police first put out a statement about what had occurred. They essentially said that a staff member at the high school had called police because a suspended student was refusing to leave willingly. When police arrived, he asked her several times to leave campus. She refused, so he handcuffed her and walked her towards the office. And during that process, she tried to escape, was, wasn't being cooperative, and that's when he threw her to the ground uh, on two different occasions. Now, there is a community activist who has contacted the family, has been speaking on behalf of them. She actually describes a little bit of a different situation, that the teenager was uh, on in-school suspension, so she was supposed to be in campus, mm -hmm. and when she went, her she started to feel ill. Uh, she explained to the teacher that she was anemic and that this is something that she'd experienced before. And allegedly, the teacher in the class accused her of being on drugs. She asked to search the student's backpack. The student complied. The teacher found a pepper spray inside her bag, which the student explains she carries with her because she takes the trolley to school every morning from Southeast San Diego. And ultimately, the student really felt like she was not being treated fairly. She didn't want to leave campus. She wanted to discuss the situation further. Uh, as Aramik Blake, who is the spokesman who has been speaking on behalf of the family, explained, she was trying to advocate for herself when police showed up and took her away and the altercation ensued. And that altercation was ultimately, the second half of it, caught on camera and yeah. people have been reacting to the images they saw in that video, so much so that on Monday, some of the students actually staged a walkout and KPBS was there and we spoke to one of the students who participated and here's what she said about why they were protesting. This could have been your kid. When, you, when we ask you to put yourself in our place, do it genuinely. When we ask the police to look back on their force and look back on their terms and how they're gonna handle the situation, how they investigate in it, do it genuinely. Don't just give us your words to make you look good. Yeah. Do it genuinely because we are not gonna stand here and sit back and do another one of our students. As you can hear, she sounded very emotional. What were some of the other messages from participants on Monday? Yeah, I think that students generally were very emotional, not just on behalf of a fellow student who experienced this, but because this is not, for a lot of these kids, this is not the first time that they have had, at least in their words, interactions with police that have uh, felt discriminatory or that had felt um, inappropriate. And so I think this was really an expression of something that was already building within the community. Um, but most of them just wanted to communicate that this isn't about you know, race, this isn't about gender, this is about a police officer using a completely inappropriate level of force. Lindsay, um, you know, there, there's two different stories and they're slightly different. They're not yeah. entirely different, but that's almost, regardless of who's right, let's say <clears throat> the police officer and the school is, you know, dead on with their story. 
the response, regardless, uh, you know, this looked like something out of the World Wrestling Fe Federation. Uh, you know, there were there was more than one police officer, or was it just that one police? No, officer? it was just, just one, one police officer. But <clears throat> that takedown seemed to be. Uh, I, I'm I haven't been in law enforcement, but there just sort of seems to be other ways to somehow subdue or you know coerce a person without that kind of body slam. I think that's exactly what a lot of people who are protesting this action are are trying to communicate, that there is nothing that she could have done that would have warranted that level of, of force, mm -hmm. that she wasn't a threat to people on campus, she wasn't a threat to herself or others, and so what was the rush? Why, why did we have to bring it to that level of, of force right away? So. so what has the La Mesa Police Department said about this? Uh, so the La Mesa Police Department has, has not said a ton about the situation in and of itself. They are saying that this investigation into this particular use of force is top priority right now. They are looking into it. They want to make sure that the community realizes that they realize that their reputation as a police department is really being called into question right now, um, which is actually kind of a startling thing for a police department to, stay, to say in the wake of this. So they recognize that this has really resonated with community members. So by, by saying that, though, are they in effect conceding that perhaps the way that officer responded was not consistent with the department's policy? I wouldn't say that they've gone so far as to say that. I think that what they're acknowledging is that this this instance has has really touched a nerve in the community and that they want to make sure that the community knows that they are taking that extremely seriously. Obviously any use of force is going to be treated seriously, but I think in this particular situation because we do have video footage that really is allowing people to see for themselves what occurred, they want people to know that they are looking into it. Granted, I know that, that can be slightly unsatisfying for people who are really hoping for maybe a stronger response, um, maybe the department to come out more quickly and rebuke this officer's behavior. Is there anyone at the school level uh, who's troubled by the way this mm -hmm. was handled? The school has been very quiet about this. Um, we have not had a lot of success getting much of a statement from them. All they'll really say at this point is that um, this is uh, because it involves a student, they really can't comment further. but. From students that we've spoken with, it seems that the the leadership at the school is making sure to facilitate communication with students and staff. They're obviously going to be at this community forum. They're talking about um, holding forums of their own. Um, but as far as coming out, making a statement on what has occurred, it's it's been quiet. And to be fair, the police department has taken some action. You reported that this officer has been reassigned. Can you explain that? Yeah, so he worked as a school resource officer, which means that he was one of two officers that if there was any uh, situation at a school that needed police attention, he would be sent to that. So he wasn't assigned specifically to this high school. Um, he has been removed from that position and put on administrative duties while the campus, or while the department, excuse me, uh, kind of explores and further investigates what happened. And what do we know about this officer? Mm, I mean, we know that he's been a school resource officer for a little more than a year. We know that he's been with the department itself for uh, more than nine years. Uh, we also know that he has been in other instances. He was involved in a fatal shooting some years ago. Um, but outside of that, you know, personnel files, especially in California, are usually held pretty close. In, in the overall, I mean, we've heard of, you know, student and police conflicts before, but it's still pretty rare, at least along levels like this, isn't it? Well, you know, it's kind of hard to say. I mean, mm -hmm. I think one of the things that's unique about this particular situation is you have a video. You have a video mm -hmm. that shows you what happened. Um, and as much as video is gaining momentum and is more commonly seen kind of in conjunction with police actions, we don't see it all the time, especially, I would say, when you're talking about a juvenile. And so it's, it's hard to say how prolific this is, but I would say that this level of force seems to be something rare, something more rare. And how do you think the, the video will play out in the investigation? Because it's been a big part of the story so far with it being shared on social media. I mean, I think that that video is the, going to be the crux of this investigation. And you don't have to rely on he said, she said. You really get to see what occurred. Um, granted, the video does not capture the entire incident. I think that's important to say. Um, it really is only a portion. And what we've seen on social media appears to be kind of a loop of just one um, situation. So it'll be important to determine what occurred before and after. The video also makes it clear that there were witnesses outside of the juvenile herself 
and the officer. So those people will need to be interviewed. But I think as far as really determining what happened, the video is going to, is going to be really what makes a difference. And you referenced the, the juvenile, the 17-year-old. Um, the activist has been in touch with the, the family. Any word on, on how she's doing with all of this added attention? Yeah, clearly this was a very traumatic situation for her. Um, they, uh, Aramik has said that the family nearly immediately has worked on making sure that the student has somebody to talk to about her experience, professionally talk to about her experience. But I think the support of her, her student body has made a lot of difference. Um, when the students walked out of their classes on Monday and they were kind of standing in front of the school talking about how they were feeling, um, Aramik made sure to say then that the family was so incredibly grateful for the support that they've felt, not just from fellow students, but from the community at large. And wrapping up, there's going to be a community forum. What are you expecting? I'm expecting a lot of energy there will be a lot of there will be a lot of people who have very strong feelings mm -hmm. about what needs to occur. Um, I think that we need to remember that this instance is occurring within a larger ongoing conversation nationally about police use of force and police brutality. So I think that this really can't be just looked at as a singular incident. For a lot of people, this is part of a much broader narrative, and I think you'll see that at this community meeting. Very interesting. We'll be following. Thank you so much. More than five years after a failed run for mayor, questions about dirty money follow former San Diego District Attorney Bonnie DeManis. Tens of thousands of dollars in straw donations were pumped into DeManis's campaign via donors linked to Mexican businessman Jose Susimo Azano Matsura. Azano went to prison. Demanis has pledged to give that money to charity. KPBS investigative reporter Amitha Sharma looked into where that money ended up. Amitha, what did you find? Well, um, actually, when this case first resurfaced, or actually surfaced back in 2014, the Union Tribune found um, initially uh, that there was about $10,000 in money that had been given to as to Dumanis's 2012 mayoral campaign. And at the time, she said that she intended to give that money to charity. So now that the case is over, I went back and looked at campaign disclosures from 2012, and I looked at um, court documents and San Diego City Ethics Commission documents, and I did Google searches. And I found that there was about $17,500 that came from Azano, his employees, straw donors, and people who were connected to the straw donors. I also found that there was $17,950 that came from former San Diego police detective Ernie Encinas, his relatives, friends, and people who had business ties to him. So the goal was to ask Bonnie Dumanis, um, look, you said back in 2014 that you would give $10,000 in Azana-related money to charity. A, did you do that? And B, it looks like the sum is, is larger. What, if anything, do you intend to do with that? So in addition to this funding that you found, um, prosecutors also revealed that Azano pumped more money into the campaign in other ways. Can you expand on that? Right, so that was information that, that came out when the case again surfaced back in 2014 and uh, the government said that um, Azano had basically funded $100,000 in social media services to her 2012 mayoral run and that he had also set up an independent expenditure committee to which he had contributed $100,000. So yeah, the straw donor money and the, the other related money is in addition to the $200,000. And now um, Bonnie DeManis is officially running for county supervisor for District 4. Michael, um, how do you think her ties to Azano, who's been convicted of 36 federal charges, mm -hmm. How do you think that will impact her run? Well, it, it, it's it's going to hurt. Uh, to the extent it will hurt, we don't know. I mean, that's just never a good thing. This is a guy that, you know, as you mentioned, 36 counts uh, on, you know, in federal court. Uh, the prosecutor said he wanted to turn our Bayfront into Miami West. Uh, there's a lot of baggage that goes along with this, and and. 
uh, you know, being tied with a person like that is, is a very difficult thing to run for office for. And this isn't just a cursory tie. Um, one of the biggest problems she faces is she's got a lot of explaining to do. Um, obviously, as, you know, as Mitha would point out, they didn't really respond to her inquiries on that aspect of it. But on the overall, um, you know, when this first came out, she had vague recollection of who this person was. Well, then it trickled all through reporting and court records that, well, she was in on uh, conference calls with him. Uh, there were emails in which she even called him Mr. A, which, uh, you know, some people called like almost a nickname. Uh, there were other meetings uh, that, that she, she went, failed to expose. She went to Sheriff Gore's office, took him Correct. with her to make an introduction. Yeah, and so, you know, either she sort of being was being disingenuous, uh, you know, early on as to what the extent of her knowledge of him was, or she doesn't really remember that much, which is a whole other issue if you're, you know, running for a high public office and you don't, you know, know who these people are that you're having multiple meetings with that you know are trying to, to help fund your campaign. Those are serious issues. So, uh, you know, even under the best of circumstances, it, it doesn't look good. Um, you know, she hasn't been charged. We always have to, you know, point that out and hasn't been implicated. But uh, it, it's a very bad um, optics for her, and I, I don't know, do they expect to just, you know, let time kind of distance this, and that's water under the bridge. But we've seen in campaigns, you know, since the beginning of, of the nation that, that people think that, that stuff that happened in the past is in the past, and then it gains a new life during a campaign. Uh, I think that, that some, you know, some entities will try to make uh, Asano seem like her running mate uh, during this campaign. But I actually don't think it'll affect her, and here's mm -hmm. why. When the case was unsealed in early 2014. Dumanis was in the middle of an election or a campaign uh, for her fourth term as district attorney. A lot of this information was coming out at the time, and she won that election handily. So I don't know that this is an issue that that people get that resonates with them or that they care about. I, and, and I agree. You know, there's sort of a, there's a been a Teflon quality, I think, about Bonnie Demands, at, as, at least as DA. Uh, now, I will say, I think a lot of the, the, the deeper connections were didn't really come out until afterwards, but it was, but clear, was, there was clear there was, there was a connection. Yeah. Um, <clears throat> you know, she had been in office for, for, what was it, three terms, and that was her fourth mm -hmm. real term that she was reelected for. Uh, you know, you mentioned the, the, the 2012 mayoral race. She did not do well there. So is that a new constituency? Is that a, a, you know, a new dynamic? Um, a, a, you know, she was so strong in that office. We'll see how that happens. But like I said, at the very least, I think that it's something that she's going to have to talk about, and that's never good. Will it, you know, be the kill her as a, her candidacy? I, you know, I couldn't say that. And I, you know, like Amitha says, that it caused a lot of uh, uh, discussion in political circles and in the press, but I don't know that, that during all this that the, the public was, you know, suddenly having a whole bunch of second thoughts about Bonnie DeManis. And you, you touch on her, her run for mayor in 2012, mm -hmm. and in both of your, your recent stories, you also mentioned um, former Assemblyman Nathan Fletcher, who also ran in 2012. Mm -hmm. And in your report, Amita, um, you reported that his campaign also received straw donations. How does this differ? So, so he got $3,000 uh, in straw donations from a towing company. The towing company was cited by the City Ethics Commission. Fletcher was not. Bonnie Dumanis received $6,000 in straw donations from towing companies. Those companies were cited. She was not. But in the case of Fletcher, when he ran in the special mayoral ele uh, election in 2013, um, there was a guy who co-founded a flip-flop company in La Jolla and he donated $4,000 to Fletcher's campaign, $1,000 in his name, and $3,000 um, a piece in the name of each of his triplets, who were 16 at the time. Those triplets had access to a trust. Um, according to Fletcher, this guy had given instructions to an accountant to transfer that money out of his kids' trust back to, to, to reimburse him. Uh, the City Ethics Commission says that that was never done, even if that was the intention. The transfer never happened, and thus the, the Ethics Commission cited Nathan Fletcher, Dingdon, for $3,000, and he paid. So there's no legal obligation to return the, the straw donations. So what's the ethical question? Well, not unless the candidate knew that the money was illicit. Um, Dan Schnur, who is the former head of the California Fair Political Practices Commission, says that there are other reasons that could come into play. Here's what he says. There's an issue of perception here, and ultimately it's up to the candidate to decide, him or herself, whether that perception 
is sufficiently damaging to their election prospects or to their reputation to require returning the funds uh, to their original sources. Um, but there's no absolute, there's no black and white answer on this. Some candidates decide that returning the money is the right thing to do for not only moral or ethical, but also very practical political reasons. And then in the case of Bonnie Dumanis, because she's running for the Board of Supervisors, um, that run could be a practical political reason. And how do you think this will, will all play out, Michael? Well, uh, you know, we were sort of scratching the surface of both candidates are very well known. Uh, they've got a lot of support, I think. They also have a lot of baggage on various levels. Uh, you know, we've talked about the finances. There's other things about their records, uh, you know, and, and changing positions and so forth. Uh, and also what they bring, I think, you know, where they go in a positive direction. Uh, so, um, you know, the, the district, we tend to look through at things through a partisan prism all the time. It's a very democratic district, but the Board of Supervisors technically is nonpartisan, but partisan politics always plays in there. Now, Bonnie Dumanis is not running as a Republican. I think you'll see Nathan Fletcher more lean on, on uh, the Democrats and, and Democratic themes uh, because that's to his advantage. Uh, you know, some people seem to think it's his to lose because of those dynamics. But uh, you know, as, as Amitha said, that that uh, you know we get wrapped up a lot in in these uh, controversies and, and scandals, if you will. And I, I don't know how much those resonate in the public. So I, ultimately, I think it, who runs the better campaign and whether uh, you know the the national politics comes into play, which I think would be to Nathan Fletcher Nathan Fletcher's advantage with the whole controversy over Trump and things like that. Very interesting. Demand for luxury high-rise condos shoots up in Tijuana and developers are responding. The border city is expecting a historic residential construction boom with 500 new condos set to hit the market this year. At the same time, Mexico's peso is down and violent crime in Tijuana is up. Philip, what's driving this condo craze? Well, uh, Tijuana, a lot like around here, um, really stopped building as much residential housing during the recession. Uh, pretty much stopped. There wasn't anything new to come out on the market. But the interesting thing lately is, at least for the last three years, they've really been building in earnest is condos. Tons of towers just going up all over the city. Uh, I've been reporting there for about two and a half years, and it's pretty wild to go back there now and just to see, like, oh, there's a tower there that wasn't there before, there's another one. Or sometimes I'll be in a dirt field just like talking to a developer, and then I come back like six months later and there's a building. So there's a lot of pent up demand in the city, mostly, almost entirely for Mexicans, to be homeowners for a lot of the same reasons why people want to be homeowners here in uh, the United States. So the buyers, for the most part, are from Mexico. What about the international buyer, um, maybe an American who's looking for a deal? How much of the market is being driven by that? Right. Well, not much at all. Um, most people will tell me that their project, you know, they're selling to about 2% Americans or maybe up to 10% at some of the higher end ones. Um, a lot of the people I interview are, they're American. They might have been uh, originally from Mexico, come over to the United States, got citizenship, but later in life, they decided, you know, these condos are pretty nice in Tijuana. They're a lot cheaper than what I might get in San Diego County. So I'm going to go across the border and just go live over there. And a lot of times they have family as well. So, Phil, yeah. you mentioned that, you know, they're really marketing to, the, to Mexican citizens. But mm -hmm. is the, the sort of low percentage of American interest, does, is that because of marketing? Is it also because of, you know, I mean, there's so many problems down there. Well, not so many, but certainly the, mm -hmm. you know, the, the, the crime and the murder rate is, uh, you know, it hit records and so forth. And while, you know, people like to say, well, those are just, you know, drug people killing drug people, uh, that's a lot of dead bodies to want to go into a city and buy a condo. I know. It's, it, really, it really blows my mind because, I mean, looking at the murder rate this year, like more than 1,700, you know, my colleague Sandra Dibble has been writing a lot about it. And I would think that that would slow down construction or like have some sort of impact, but it's crazy because when I actually did the math on how many condos are coming out this year as compared to last year, it's actually a little bit more. Mm -hmm. So, it, I mean, truthfully, a lot of these projects are the ground up and you can't really stop them once they start, but it doesn't seem to be slowing down demand that I can see. Do you think so, people just become desensitized to, uh, to the level of crime? Yeah, I think so. And also another thing about a lot of these projects is they've got like big walls, security cameras. A lot of them come, you know, because they got a big price tag for Mexico. So a lot of times they'll have 24-hour guards. Almost all of them say that. 
and then CCTV cameras, all that kind of stuff. So it's kind of like used to a way of life where you have walls and uh, stuff like that. How much are the condos going for? Uh, well, on average, it's about uh, 200000 to 300000 So I haven't seen a huge difference in price uh, in the past couple of years, but some of them, like, you can get, like, a pretty huge penthouse and there was one going for 680000 which was like the most expensive. But something like that here would go for like okay. $1.8 or something insane. So When, when developers, clearly they're, they're not spending a lot of their marketing energies on Americans, but considering the housing crisis that we have here and we're continuing to work through that, are they expecting Americans to become a higher percentage of their buyers in the future? Yeah, I think it's more of wishful thinking, hmm. really. Um, you know, there's a lot of hope among developers that they will attract Americans. I mean, they do do advertisements in English. One of the biggest ones down there with like uh, four towers, you might see it right at the border, is called New City. Like the name's in very, English. Very so, interesting. Thank you, you know. so much. We'll have to end the conversation there. Okay. That wraps up another week of stories at the KPBS Roundtable. Thank you to our guests, Michael Smolens, Amitha Sharma, Lindsay Winkley, and Philip Monar. Uh, as a reminder, all of the stories we're discussing today are available on kpbs.org. I'm Ebony Monet. Thanks for joining us.